Good afternoon. I hope you're not too sleepy. And uh, I know lunch was good. Maybe I'll be able to wake you up. So the next presentation is going to be about robotics in construction. And what I'm going to do is explain to you a little bit the premise, why I think robots are going to take over all human jobs, at least in construction. Um, and then I will run through quite a few examples, because what I would like to do in this presentation is to open your mind to what's available today, to the technology that's already hitting the market, and if not, it's already in development. So since the beginning of time, humans have been trying to reduce the amount of work that we need to do. And not because we are lazy, but because we are creative. And we have better things to do with our time than, for example, washing. The washing machine is a good example because it's the best innovation of the Industrial Revolution, at least from the women's perspective. And please, don't throw stones. From the early 20th century, women were investing 60 to 70 hours every week just to wash clothes. The washboard was a great invention. But then in the 1970s, the washing machine came. And what happened? Women invested less than 20 hours a week in washing. And now, meet Foldit. Foldit is a robot. You put dirty washing on one side, you get clean folded washing on the other side. And the price point that they want to do here is $1,000, so pretty affordable. So we develop robots because we want to do less ro work. And now I'm here to tell you that the robots are already here. It's not science fiction, it's science today. So meet Flippy. Flippy is the robot that is making hamburgers already in California. There is a hamburger joint you can go, and the robot is making your hamburgers. And meet Cafe X. This is a coffee barista, robot making your coffee. What's interesting about these two examples is that it is low-skill labor that we are automating. So it is not the high-skill, high-pay labor that um, we would imagine that we're automating, but the low-skill. So the arbitrage for efficiency, when you're talking about higher-pay labor, is massive. And that's why this statement, I believe, is true. According to a 2017 Oxford report, 47% of jobs in the United States today can be automated. And you know what? They can be automated with currently existing technology. So if today we stopped innovating, closed down all the universities, all the startups, everything, we can already replace half of the labor force in the United States. And if we think of developing countries or countries where the amount of labor is more manual, these numbers are even greater. So in this revolution, there are going to be big winners and big losers. And I would like to go through three major industries that are already going through this transformation before we get to construction. The first is shipping. According to Allianz, 96% of all accidents in the maritime are because of human error. And if you think that 80% in volume and 70% in value of all the goods in the world are transported by sea, there is no reason why Google and Rolls-Royce shouldn't launch the first drone that you see here in 2019. That's next year. Agriculture. We want to feed the world population with low-cost, high-quality food. According to, global, to Goldman Sachs, robotic agriculture is already a $240 billion industry. And with numbers like this, it makes sense. This is just lettuce picking. And robots are twice as better as humans. Tracking. This shouldn't come as a surprise because it's in the media all the time. And it's already a $700 billion industry in the United States alone. And you want to know why? Not because all the goods in the United States, almost all the goods are going through trucks, but because trucks in the United States cause 4,000 deaths every single year. To me, in 2018, this sounds completely irrational and should not exist. So these were three major industries, but now let's talk about construction. Because construction touches the lives of every single person on Earth, whether at work, at home, on the street, the infrastructure, everything at the end of the day is related to construction. So I mean, construction is a hot topic. If you look just at Google search terms, in the last eight years, this is the graph. And this is just how people are searching for the word PropTech. But if you look at investment, it's correlated. 
4.3 billion dollars investment in private companies in construction tech. This is great. This is amazing. But you know what? According to McKinsey, construction is still the third least digitized sector after hunting. Yeah, I know. And this actually, this McKinsey Global Institute is the Bible of construction. Every major construction firm in the world, their leadership have probably read this report. So this, again, shouldn't be new to anyone in the sector. But this still is very surprising. Less than 1% invested in R&D as a sector. There is no question that this does not lead to good innovation. But still, when we talk about innovation, everyone in the sector of construction says, no, 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 there's great innovation. All this money is invested in software. We have BIM, building information management or modeling. And it's right, BIM has existed in the industry since the early 90s. But ask anyone in the industry, and they will tell you, it's not really implemented. Actually, less than 10% of construction projects implement BIM end-to-end. -end. Right? And this is just software. It should be very easy to implement. But still, it's not. So the innovation breakthrough that I'd like to show you today isn't coming from here. And now I'd like to make two predictions. Within the next 15 years, we're going to see complete disruption to two sides of construction. The process, how we build, and the materials, what we use to build. And the reason we're going to see these disruptions is not because of prop tech or construction tech or the lack of innovation from the construction industry, but because of the private space industry. Humans are very bad at surviving in space. So we need machines to do the job for us. And the last decade has seen $350 billion invested in private space industries. These are just a few of the companies. The next two decades, according to The Economist, will see $3 trillion invested. That's an order of magnitude greater. This is a greater jump than construction has done in maybe 200 years. So for those of you who are not in the industry, this is what construction looks like today. The people carrying, doing everything, 100% manual, on-site construction. Some amazing companies like Catera, Blue Home, Planet Prefab are doing off-site construction, Prefab. In a factory, factory settings, millimeter precision. But go back to the first picture because humans are still putting these together. And that is the weak link. And also, if you think about Prefab, it's a, an amazing factory somewhere over there. And the construction site is somewhere over there. And this, to me at least, doesn't make sense, to ship all these goods from one place to another. So in my opinion, the process, the future, is going to actually be more like this picture, fully autonomous machines. And when we talk about fully autonomous machines, we can start looking at different materials, because suddenly we're not constrained to the physical body, to the human uh, uh, strength, speed, or durability, to the way we can perceive things, to our size, right? So, I'm going to now run through quite a few of examples of different technologies. The first step is going to be augmenting the human and moving it to robot. So what does it mean to augment human capabilities? It means things like this, right? This machine is still operated by the human brain, so it's practically a dumb machine, but it's very strong, very big, and augments human power. And this one, it's augmenting human precision. So allowing us to do things that are super precise, more better than our eye can see. These two are amazing, amazing projects from, uh, for research from academics. But if we want to look at what's happening in the market, let's look at this. Volvo and BMW have already implemented this. This is ESCO. On the one side, you see the top half of the body being uh, augmented. So now people can pick up twice what they could do and don't feel the, uh, the weight on their bones. And on the other side, you see augmenting our uh, mobility. And BMW are actually investing in this to see how they can help people with disabilities regain their capacity to walk, and also how they can use this in factories. So I think these are fantastic. This is augmenting the human side, maybe the easiest example to relate to, right? Augmented reality. What we have here is the ability to look through walls. So if we've made a mistake in level one, we can see it before we reach level 50. And if it's one centimeter on level one, it's probably five meters on, on level 50. And we don't want to get to that type of mistake. 
So this is saving a lot of money when we are doing, uh, uh, when, we, when we are building. Drones, I'm sure all of you have, are familiar with, they're giving us an eye in the sky. Um, and I have a funny story about this. I don't know how many of you have seen the new uh, Apple headquarters. It uh, looks like a donut. It was the first project in the United States that implemented drones. And you would think that they implemented drones for safety, to make sure that no one is getting hurt, to make sure that the work is happening properly. But actually, the workforce used this to find the lavatories, the toilets. So they didn't have to walk through the entire site to know where they have to go when they have to go. And while this is not what the inventors of technology intended, when they asked the workforce and the work managers about this, actually it was the best implementation because the work site stayed clean and the workforce were happy. So technology is being implemented, maybe not in the way that the developers are thinking, but definitely implemented. This picture is a paraphrase from a famous picture from the 1920s. And while I don't think the future will look like this in humanoid robots, um, it will look like this in the sense that there will be one person in charge of lots of machines. And these machines will be sentient. They will have intelligence. And while I don't think the future looks like this, Boston Dynamics do. Um, and this robot is going to do drywalls. Pretty slow. So like I said, I don't think the future of construction is robots that look like humans, act like humans, and move like humans. I think that the future of robots in construction are things that are not humanoid, like the drilling robot, already implemented. So you don't need to look like a human to do the job. And you can see the three people there in the background. They're not doing anything. This is the painting robot. So this was the first iteration, actually. Uh, the company didn't give me a, their newer version to, to show you here. I'm sorry. Um, but this robot, you put in the coordinates of the room. You step back, and it paints the room for you. So maybe one day this will come in a miniature size we can use in our homes. But for large construction, it's already implemented. Now, for anyone who's doing finishing in construction, you know that laying the tiles on the floor is probably one of the most expensive parts of construction. So meet a tile laying robot. Right? Now you can start imagining how maybe this can finish your kitchen. Or maybe you can do other things. Spackling. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the word in, in Spanish. Um, and the, um, but Okibo, a company from Israel, are already using existing uh, machines to do the outside leveling of the walls on a construction site. Earth moving. Build robotics are taking the same technology from autonomous cars, putting them in tractors that already exist, and allowing them to do the material movement on the construction site. This is a $130 billion industry that this one company is disrupting. And within three years, we're going to see at least five or six more of these types of companies come up. Um, Volvo has already shown interest in creating such machines, so you don't have to renovate, uh, innovate them. They're coming like this out of the factory. Can we put on the other screen that uh, just turned off? Sorry. On a larger scale, Komatsu and Caterpillar are creating these types of machines. So this is not new. This is a 500-ton haul truck used in mines to move Earth. But what's strange about this picture? There is no cabin for a driver. No place for a human. This haul truck was already implemented by Rio Tinto in Australia. And after one year, increased output by 19%. We're talking tens of billions of dollars in additional revenue just from one small innovation. So we looked at a bit augmenting human capabilities and a bit of robotics. But all the machines I showed you are still kind of controlled from afar. They have a human supervisor. The next thing we need to do is to change the machines, the, the materials. Because if we have machines that can do amazing stuff, now we need materials that can uh, do amazing stuff equally. And so the brick 
is not one of these innovations. It was a great innovation 8,000 years ago, right? It was designed for the human hand, very easy to pick up and manipulate. It's actually still, 8,000 years later, the most common building block or material. Um, but some companies are innovating here also. So Fastbrick from Australia created this giant hyper-precise machine. Now, you might be thinking, why create such a big robot for such an old technology like the brick? But there is sense here. Because when you use this machine or this one, you don't need mortar to stick between the, the bricks. Because the mortar was used to level them to make it straight. When you have nanoscale precision, you don't need mortar. When you save mortar in construction, you're saving 25% of the time and 20% of the cost of material. So it might make sense. Now using robotics for a completely different thing. Computer vision for restoration with the precision of a robot. So what we see on one side is basically the, uh, a broken uh, Roman temple. And with computer simulations, we can uh, recreate it, send the file to the ro white robotic arm you can see there, and like a CNC, it is cutting away the stone and it is recreating the pillars. So if we can recreate Roman uh, uh, pillars, so then we can do crazy art um, for our homes, right? Without this additional cost of getting a mason to come and do it one by one. And if we're already in aesthetics, then let's go a step further. Every time in construction we want to do something new, we need to make a new form, a new mold, to pour the concrete in and make this unique shape, right? Imagine uh, Zaha Hadid or Norman Foster buildings. But with the use of robotics, we can actually cut through stone and create uh, these formworks without the additional cost um, as it used to be associated. And then you have MX3D. So MX3D are the same types of robots that were cutting the stone. They are actually 3D printing, so fabricating from nothing steel to make a bridge. And what's really unique here, that you don't need infrastructure. The machine is building the bridge, then going on top of it and continuing to build it. So basically creating the infrastructure for itself. Now for something that is implemented. Right? So 3D printing, I'm sure lots of you have heard, and it sounds like science fiction. But in Crossrail in the UK, it's an underground station, they used a multi-material 3D printer. So this is taking from what I showed you before, the pink or the red is the formwork that was 3D printed. And then the concrete was poured in and they created the subway station. So all of the elements you see here are concrete that were molded from a 3D printed mold. And it didn't cost them that much. So now going from small scale individual units to super large scale 3D printing. Out of MIT, you have a form printer. So when you, make a, when you build a house or any structure from concrete, you first of all do form work, normally from wood, and then you pour concrete inside. In this case, you don't need the form work. The robot is making the form work itself, and then the person will come and pour the concrete inside. Or maybe we take it a step further and we say, we don't need form work at all, we just 3D print the concrete. Apiscore from Russia, were one of the first to prove that they could print a 100 square meter house in less than 24 hours. And then Icon and New Story came and said, you know what, we're going to make affordable housing. And what you're looking at is the first 3D printed home that someone is living in in Austin, Texas. Not so far from here. So up until this point, I showed you great machines and great materials but everything looked kind of the same as we were used to until today. AI Build, which is a subsidiary of Zara Hadid Architects, have sought to recreate reinforcement. So instead of putting steel inside the concrete, they're actually creating a superstructure on the outside of the concrete, and together with concrete, they are making very unique architecture. And this is nice, but when are we building with it? Well, Branch Technologies from Sacramento are already building with it. The orange structure you can see here, can you guess what that is? Probably not. It's a landing pad for a helicopter. If it can hold a helicopter when it's landing, it can probably hold a house. 
And this is a quick example of what it's actually building. Not steel, but plastic polymer. So if it's plastic polymer, it's synthetic. It means we don't have to go to a query. We can actually create it in the lab, like um, the session before we're talking about. OK. So we saw very cool machines, and we saw kind of new materials. But we have a very big problem that not many people are talking about. And the problem is concrete. And Temex, don't kill me. The problem with concrete is that it is an amazing material. So amazing that in the last decade, the equivalent of concrete we've used in the wor world is like building a three-floor wall on each side of the equator around the entire Earth. And that's just one decade of concrete that we've used. So we actually have to find a new substitute for the sand inside the concrete, because this sand is finite. Well, we're already doing something about it. Finite is a company that is looking at the desert. The desert sand used to be uh, 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 unusable, because it's too fine. It doesn't create the compression strength that we would want for concrete. And it's still not quite there, but it's getting there. And if you think of the desert, then suddenly this finite material is not finite anymore. It's infinite. We still have the problem, though, that making concrete is polluting our environment. Actually, 5% of global greenhouse gases are created from just making the concrete, not even the construction industry. So there's also a solution here. Companies like Solidia are making a different type of cement, not Portland cement, that creates CO2 into the environment, but cement that absorbs CO2 from the environment. So we build and we make our world cleaner. I'd like to stop this segment with a quick video that I made, um, just kind of showcasing a bit of the technologies that uh, we went through here now. There we go. So this is concrete 3D printing. The future of modular housing. You want more, you add it. You want less, you take it away. Materials that are 10,000 stronger than steel, but lighter than a feather. 37 square foot apartment that is fully robotic, so it actually turns into 100 square foot. This was their first one, where they still needed mortar. And in Japan, they think that offshore construction would look like this, where we just send the robots there, and when it's done, the humans will come to habitate it. This is already the future. This is 4D printing. If you want to know about that, come talk to me afterwards. So in the last few minutes that I have, and I hope this was an overload to your brain, um, because I hope that what this does, maybe tomorrow, maybe in a week, maybe in a year, it will spark some imagination in you to say, you know what? We can go do the construction differently. We can bring this technology that we've seen in medicine or we've seen in uh, agriculture and bring it into construction. Because I believe at least that construction is the most important sector we have in the world. Everybody uses housing. And without housing, we don't have access to clean water. We don't have access to safety. We maybe don't have access to food. So housing is really important. But changing the construction industry is really difficult. And so I'd like to finish with just one thing that uh, one of my companies is doing. And instead of construction, we have started with maintenance. So maybe not as sexy, but bear with me. The window cleaning industry hasn't changed since window cleaning was invented. And that was a really long time ago. This video is from the 1930s. This is the Empire State Building and how it was cleaned back then. And this is how it's clean today. So you look at this, and you see 10 people hanging hundreds of feet in the air. When I look at this, I see 10 people. Each one of them had to be certified for 3,216 hours to be a window cleaner in New York City. If you do the math, this is the equivalent of an engineering diploma. I think they should have studied engineering, because at Skyline Robotics, we're creating robots to actually 
do this job for them because we think that in 2018 it is irrational for people to risk their lives hanging just to clean windows. And you know what? The numbers are speaking to our favor because in the window cleaning industry, 8% profit is the norm. This means in America, the window cleaning industry is taking home $800 million from a $10 billion pie. At, with, uh, by using Skyline, we're helping them go from 8% to 60% in profit. And these low margins are similar to all types of maintenance work. Actually, construction is very similar in the uh, labor intensity um, to maintenance. And just to leave you with this, this is what our project product looks like. I really like looking at them. Um, and so thank you for your attention. Thank you for bearing with me. I hope this was... <laughs> I hope this will really inspire you to the, the I will stand here. So I hope this will really inspire you to, to, to really rethink the construction industry if it's your industry. Um, and if not, and you're in a different industry, then understand that the construction industry is down here in terms of innovation. So wherever you are working, it's probably going to be easier for you to implement technology and innovation, exponential innovation, than it is in construction. So go ahead and do it. Thank you.